was uh, running an independent insurance agency, which is my main experience in the insurance world. I was a, a captive producer uh, for a state farm agent for a few years, but then I went out on my own and uh, became an independent agency owner. And so as I was growing that business, uh, my best friends in the business were real estate agents and mortgage lenders. Those <laughs> were my those were my people, man. That was the way I built my business was developing those strategic uh, relationships. And so, uh, but but the way a lot of people go about building that business with those referral partners is a quid pro quo. Like I scratch your back, you scratch mine. You give me a lead, I give you a mm -hmm. lead, and that's really hard to scale especially if you're like me as an insurance agent and you're on the back end of the referral process uh, pipeline, I'm getting referrals sent to me, people who are already under contract. I don't really have as many referrals to send out. So how do I scale it? Mm -hmm. So the way I decided to scale my business was in part by partnering with my RPs and imparting, um, we would do workshops. We would do, I would do coaching with them. I would ask them this question, other than sending you a lead or a referral, uh, what else can I do to add value to your business? Other than a lead, what else is most important to you? What are your challenges in business? And I would find those things out. Well, as I did that with loan officers and realtors, over time, I would notice threads and you could sense shifts and mindsets. Mm -hmm. And when I would identify a problem, we would host a workshop or an event to address that for multiple. And we would pull in these realtors and mortgage lenders who would attend our workshop because usually if a few lenders are dealing with the problem, lots of lenders are. Sure. And so all that to say is I met Kyle at one of those events where he was speaking at it and then we had a, a part to play and we just shared this common desire to network with people in our space, but also mm -hmm. not just do it in a superficial exchange leads way, but to do it in a deeper way where we're actually helping each other be better professionals, but better people. And that yeah. really uh, just was an initial uh, bond between Kyle and I. That's right, man. I love that. Um, and I think I heard I heard one of this in maybe one of your your uh, promo videos or whatever, but I, it's iron sharpens iron, right? Yes. Um, and so... You know, uh, so tell me in those in those events, like what have you found was like specifically that that value add where people were just like, this is the sellout, right? Yeah. Like this topic or this subject. Um, and maybe it's changed over time, right? Because sure. I mean, things have been changing and shifting so much. What would you say that is? Yeah, there was a lot of them, but I would say one of my bread and butter uh, pieces ended up being uh, time management, which is actually a misnomer. <laughs> you know, I think it was Stephen Covey who said time management is a misnomer. You can't manage time. You can only manage yourself. And uh, but the idea of time management are uh, creating your schedule, your focus, balance. Those things tend to be uh, challenges for realtors and mortgage lenders, especially insurance agents too, but more so for these realtors and lenders who are expected to be so responsive and basically on call 24 seven, you know, for their clients. Mm -hmm. And so they feel an enormous amount of pressure, especially if they have a family and they have hobbies and friends and they're trying to stay healthy. It's really difficult to balance all of those things in life. And so we found a, a sweet spot with these ambitious professionals who said, man, if you've got some uh, tools or some wisdom to help me create more focus and balance, I could benefit from that. So that was one of them that we gained a lot from. We did um, Never Split the Difference. We did a workshop based on the idea behind that book. Uh, Never Split the Difference is a book about negotiation. Have you heard of that one? Do you know that book at all? I, I've heard of it and, and I've not, not read it. Yeah. Well, it's fantastic. And I think as a real estate agent, a lot of the value adds in the past if I'm just being honest with you, you know, some people say realtors are no longer um, valuable or needed. I think they still have an incredible place in the industry, but it is true that some of the things that realtors used to do uh, aren't valued as much anymore because of technology and online listings and things like that. So to me, if I was going to be a realtor, I would put an enormous amount of time into my communication skills and specifically how do I negotiate? Because if I can become a good negotiator, well, now that's a great value add. And I would want to call that realtor if they were known as the best negotiator, whether I'm selling or buying. Mm. So that was a good one for the realtors, uh, the, the time management, and then just vision, goals, uh, helping people get 
uh, clarity around those. Many times people have hopes and ambitions, but that's not the same thing as a clear vision or a clear goal. And so that was some of our workshops. Man, we did all we did all kinds. Uh, ideal team player was one of the ones we did as some of these teams were trying to expand and grow. We would come in and say, hey, what is an ideal team player? By the way, the short answer on that based on Patrick Lencioni's book is humble, hungry, smart. You got to have a humble, hungry, smart person. Now, you may need more than that in an individual, but you got to have at least those three things for them to be a good team player. So, yeah, we did all types of topics and discussions like that. That's awesome. And, and I am familiar with uh, with with Len, Patrick Lencioni and I, I'm a Maxwell guy myself. Yeah. And so, you know, the, the same <laughs> circles, man. It's all it's all about personal growth and development. I love it. So it's interesting. So you talk about these these topics that you share, you know, from your perspective um, as a trainer, as a coach, as a business owner, um, which have nothing to do with, you know, the insurance business, yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it, it actually doesn't even have anything to do with real estate doesn't have anything to do with mortgage at the end of the yes. day. It's it's somebody that can speak to us that gets us that that can engage um, and teach me something you know that yeah, exactly. I, that would that would immediately grow my value um, and and I love that humble hungry smart right those are I think uh, I think he calls them he's like the the non like non starters like if you're missing one of those yes. three, I don't care how you know how strong you are on the other two if you're missing you know if you're missing smart I, <laughs> I, yes. I can't train you in that <laughs> in that regard. Um, You're right on, man. And that was the kind of workshops we did because let me tell you something. There are some of the people that will be listening to this podcast mm. and the reasons that they have created in their mind for their lack of growth and not being in the place they want to be are reasons like the carriers, the underwriters, the market, the competition, the other people on my team, the other people in my town or my city. They're creating all these things. And I just going to be very, I'm going to be very blunt right here. Your biggest problem is the person that you look at in the mirror each day, that person you're brushing your teeth with and looking at you in the mirror, like that's your challenge. Mm -hmm. And if you can get that straight, if you can handle that, a lot of these other business issues take care of themselves. What's between the ears makes much more of a difference than what's happening in the marketplace. And so what I found was the absolute best salespeople, sales leaders, business owners are those people who are happier, healthier, who had strong relationships, who are managing their time well, managing their money well. Those people are the ones who could go into the marketplace and actually win big. And so it wasn't about how to hustle more. And I don't want to step on any toes. And I don't know about any year of the previous guests or anything like that. I don't know their philosophy, but this whole idea of the way to get ahead is just work harder, work longer, work more, hustle more. To me, that is a lie. Like you do have to work hard, elbow grease, sweat. It's all a part of it. Mm -hmm. But the idea of just hustling more is actually what's causing some of the listeners it's causing their business to actually uh, lose business and either stall out or fail. Some people need to take a breath and just start investing in themselves, get their perspective right. And all of a sudden, as they work less, they'll accomplish more. And that's an amazing thing. That's right. Well, and then the, the, the thing is, I, I feel like, Justin, like a leader, like you might come in and be able to say, okay, when we take that pause, what do we do during that pause? Mm, mm -hmm. right because it's like sure i can i can stop I, I can stop or slow down or at least build time into my calendar for a pause right because i'm not going to stop yes. production that's that's the that's the you know lifeblood of my business mm -hmm. but if i go ahead and take that pause tell me tell me what i'm doing with that time justin like yeah. you know it's not just like pause <laughs> and i think you know for some people it's something different right some people like to meditate other people you know like like myself i i enjoy praying and and getting yes. in the word um and i think it's some of the the principalities but what are some of the practical things um you know you even mentioned like like the mile michael hyatt um what was it the planner i forget the, the name yeah the full focus planner and yeah. if anybody wants to purchase one of those from me you can go to the full focus planner.com the full focus planner.com and they're available and those are incredible tools but yeah there's lots of them uh out there uh one of my favorite phrases from dave ramsey and i don't agree with a hundred percent of his uh financial stuff uh but he's got really good fundamentals but one of my favorite quotes of his is that a budget is telling your money where to go instead of wondering where it went. 
So a budget's telling your money where to go instead of wondering where it went. Well, think about that in terms of your time, your focus, and your energy. Are you telling your time, your focus, and your energy where to go? Or are you wondering like, man, where did I spend this week? Or like, man, why am I so tired? I just feel like I spun wheels all day. Well, it's because you're not sitting aside time to tell it where to go. And so the single best practice for some people listening to this is start planning your quarter, plan each week and plan each morning. If you will do a quarterly, weekly and morning routine where you're being intentional and proactive and you're attacking it with the plan, you're telling it all where to go, that alone is going to help you be more efficient. Uh, but yeah, based on your situation, you may need to be reading more. Maybe you need to be investing in your health. Maybe it's your family dynamics, you know, because if you're, I mean, I'll just tell you, I'm married. I've got four kiddos. And if something's going on wrong with me and the wife, like it spills over into my interactions at work. Even if I try to hide it, I'm lacking that positive magnetism because I'm thinking about that argument that we had or that issue that's going on. The best times that I come to work and I'm in the right frame of mind, it's usually when things are going great at home. And so we think by, well, I just need to get to work and work harder. Well, if you're doing that at the expense of your health, your relationships and these other areas, you're really working harder, but that doesn't mean you're accomplishing more. So, yeah, it's, that's so true. And, and, and I appreciate you going uh, kind of touching into the, the idea of, Hey, you have a personal life outside of your business life. Um, but obviously the, the, the ones that do it the best. And, and what I've seen is, is they make, they're, they're able to intertwine the two because they're enjoyable to the sense that yes. you understand that one really needs the other. Exactly. Um, so let's take a break and, and kind of step back into, because really, you know, as you start talking about family and I'm a family man myself, but, um, you know, tell, tell us a little bit about your why, right? Like maybe, and, and if you can even maybe start with a little bit of the, the backstory and how you even got into mm -hmm. this, I don't know too many people unless their, their parents owned a, you know, an insurance yeah. business or that, <laughs> how you got into that. And, and maybe, uh, yeah, maybe a little bit of the driving purpose behind, behind all the things that you're doing that you're creating here. Man. Yeah. Thank you for that. Well, I'll try to keep it, you know, as brief as possible here, but the uh, quick story is I was raised in Northeast Louisiana. Uh, I live in Texas now, but I uh, was originally a Louisiana boy and my dad was a high school dropout. My mom was a public school teacher. Uh, I had a couple of sisters and we were in a very small rural um, agricultural town. And uh, I can remember as a child looking through the floor of the trailer house we lived in, and I could see the ground underneath because we didn't even have a solid floor. And I just remember us struggling, but I can remember us picking up cans on the side of the road to go take them and uh, recycle them for a little bit of cash so we could get groceries. And I had a it, it, that created this weird uh, outlook on life in a lot of ways. And we were very involved in our church. And somewhere along the way, I had this idea that money was bad. Rich people were evil. And if you were successful in business, you cheated your way to get there. And that was my paradigm. And uh, part of my faith talked about the danger of uh, chasing money and chasing riches and loving money. And so I just thought all things money is bad. And if I or all things money are bad. And if I want to be a good person in the world, and I did want to be good, like you just have to help people and you got to do that. And all I'd say, I ended up going into ministry, Christian ministry, because I thought I'm going to sacrifice and I don't need all of these, you know, worldly things out there. And so I spent uh, a decade in the ministry. The, the My first entrepreneurial kind of thing was really planting a church. We were in a movie theater in a mall, and uh, that was an experience. Uh, that was in 2008, by the way. So, wow. you know, you want to do something, go try to start a nonprofit organization in the middle of a recession. That's right. <laughs> that was really tough, but I uh, learned a lot of lessons through that. And one of the things about that church plant was uh, I hated this phrase. The phrase was nickels and noses. And it was because I was being held accountable to the nickels and noses in our church as the lead church planter. I had to report on our attendance and on our budget. And there were people who were supporting our work and we were a nonprofit. So we were required to report these things. And because of my view on money and numbers, I was ignorant and I was weak in those areas. I love the words. I love the serving people and teaching people and uh, counseling and all of that. 
but I will tell you that our church plant really struggled in a lot of ways. And yes, it was had part to do with we were in the session, but part of it was my lack of responsibility around the business side of what we were doing. Mm -hmm. And it was because of my, uh, actually, I looked down on business people. And so anyway, we did some other things. I got married, had a kiddo, and then we were still dealing with ministry things and kind of just struggling through financially. And we decided we're going to move. I was doing my seminary degree. We decided to move to Fort Worth. And I was like, I'm going to finish out my master's there. And then I told my family, I'll be back next year. Like, just let me finish out my degree. I just want to stop working for a bit and I'll see you guys next year. And we got out here and I just felt the tug in my heart and the calling to say, Justin, you're getting this all wrong. And you're ignorant and afraid of business. You are intimidated by it. And that's the exact area you're about to go into. I'm calling you to go learn business, to do it. And then you're going to use that. And that's how you're really going to serve and help people. And so that was, I don't know, maybe uh, 14 years ago or something like that when all this was transpiring. And so we, um, a door opened for me uh, at that State Farm Agency. <laughs> we're talking about. By the way, Rich Dad Poor Dad was a book I was reading around this time. And I'll never forget the line in there that says, look for a job for what you can learn, not what you can earn. Mm -hmm. And I was sharing that with the agent. I was transferring my insurance to Texas. And I mentioned that to her. And she said, well, if that's the attitude you have, you can come here and I'll hire you. You just got to get your property and casualty license and I'll bring you on. I was like, okay, how do I do it? She gave me the website. I scheduled the exam for like nine days later. The life and health was like two days after that. I had no idea that the test was going to be as hard as it was oh, yeah. for a little country boy like me. But yeah, I got my license, went into that, and I spent several years learning business. I invested and did some real estate uh, transactions, did some financial investments, played around the market a little bit, had some other upstarts that I put money into and learned a lot over those several years. Then went on to open my own agency, as I mentioned earlier, and actually I sold that agency just a few months ago. Uh, we were coming up on the $8 million of premium, and that was after about seven and a half years of running uh, that agency, but I felt the calling then to say, hey, you learned it, you've been doing it, now it's time to use it, and that's what brought me to where I am today. What I'm doing today is a smash together of my ministry background where I love to teach people, mm -hmm. serve them, counsel, guide them, make sure they're looking at the big important things of life, but also realizing that um, money in and of itself can be a, a it's not good or evil. It's based on how you use it. And right. it could be used to make a difference in the world. And we are called to enjoy things and help people be productive and profitable. So I love all of that stuff. And I've smashed it together to create what I'm doing now. That's a wonderful, <laughs> that's a wonderful picture of, um, I appreciate you sharing that. It's a wonderful picture of, um, you know, the learning, the, the, the learning experience and what, what you've, uh, what you've gained, the knowledge that you gained from, you know, having gone through that process, because they, they, they say that money is a magnifier of the person mm -hmm. that beholds that money, right? And so it's interesting that had you had money back then, you, you might have magnified <laughs> something different. But thank you know, Great I always point. say, hey, <laughs> thank God that, uh, that things have, have progressed in the in the order that they have. Um, so tell me, when was it that, you know, so first thing, you're, you talk about your, your, your wife, and, you know, and, share as much or as little as you want. Um, but I'm just curious, right? Because going through all these things, all these changes over time, um, you got to have a pretty strong support group around you mm -hmm. um, to 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 want to say, hey, uh, I I'm with you. But but Justin, just please, you know, don't forget about us, right? So maybe what was that like, as you were going through those changes? Because even today, like, you know, we still we, we still work with and hire um, agency owners, right, that want to that, that want to improve on their technologies. And so we talk to a lot of people that are in the middle of those changes. And one of the one of the things they talk about is, hey, uh, the, there's some expectations, my family and my wife has, right, or my husband has. Um, mm -hmm. What was that like going through, you know, that and, and then, and then, you know, uh, after that, I kind of want to hear maybe a story where you knew you were, you know, you were doing the right thing, right? Because, mm -hmm. um, so again, from, from, you know, from support to a story where you just knew you were in the right, in the right field. Yeah, well, um, certainly one of the things that we talk about in the coaching practice is, is, you know, people want different results and they want a different life. And if you want to do that, really 
the quickest way to different results in different life is to change your habits. Uh, in order to change your habits, you have to change individual actions. In order for your actions to change, you have to change your thoughts and your attitudes. And so the question is, is, well, how do you change your thoughts and your attitudes and your beliefs? Because that leads to all the other changes, which leads to a changed life. Well, it combines with another phrase we use, which is that your inner circle creates your inner voice. And so the people you choose to put in your inner circle, that creates your inner voice and your inner voice leads to your thoughts, your attitudes, your, your, your beliefs, which leads to your actions, which leads to your habits, which lead to, you know, really your life, uh, the results in your life. So my inner circle is definitely been a huge inspiration uh, to me along uh, this journey you know, we mentioned my wife. Uh, the funny thing is, is we met in college. And when I first met her, I was still in the very immature, idiotic stage of my financial maturity. <laughs> and so, uh, man, I tell you how bad it was. If you want to hear a story, man, I'll tell you a story. So, so this is how bad I was. Now, keep in mind, I'm doing ministry while I'm in college, you know, but I'm on staff at a church. I'm sitting in the office of another church in our town, the office of the Benevolence Fund pastor, and I'm asking their church for money. Mm -hmm. For me personally, the reason I needed money is because my utilities and the home I was renting had been disconnected. So the pastor begins to ask these discovery questions and says, well, why are your utilities disconnected? And I said, well, they, uh, you know, uh, I use the money to pay off the payday loan people. <laughs> uh. I had taken out a payday loan and he just like hands to the uh. face, like, Oh my gosh, dude, do you realize the interest on a payday loan? And he says, well, why did you do a payday loan? And I said, well, the credit card people were harassing me because I had gone over the limit on my credit card, maxed it out. And then some, and I wasn't paying my bill. And they scared me because they told me they were going to run my credit into the ground if I didn't pay my credit card bill and I would never be able to buy a car, never be able to buy a house. And so I'm freaking out. So I go do the payday loan to pay off the credit card people. And this guy, this pastor is like trying to be compassionate, but you can tell he's just like, man, what in the world? And then he says, well, why did you max out your credit card? What did you spend your money on? And I said, well, I broke up with my girlfriend and I went and bought a flat screen TV with a DVD player and surround sound. And I can, I'll never forget. I was brokenhearted. I went and spent all this money and I bought um, Pearl Harbor on DVD and I was listening to it on the surround sound. And so, man, I was Im emotionally immature, which led to the breakup, but I was financially immature as well, which led to me uh, being emotionally mature. I, I spent my money on this and it just led down this really bad path of like, man, I, I was just in a really stupid spot in my life. Well, this pastor looks at me and he says, Justin, I'm about to speak some truth and love to you. He said, it's not going to feel very loving and you may not think it's truth, but just know that's my heart. Okay. I was like, yeah, sure. I'm just like thinking in my mind, as long as I get my money and I get my water and electricity back on, I'm good. He said, uh, brother, he said, it's, it's Christians like you who give Christians like me a really bad name. And my mouth kind of dropped. And I was like, wait, did, did he just insult me? Like what? He says, we are called to give and to serve and to love and to help those in need. And he said, you are taking and you are lacking self-control and you're being selfish. And like our walk is supposed to be about serving others and you're serving yourself. He said, we love you too much here to enable you in this behavior by bailing you out of the situation. You're going to have to figure this out on your own. He said, uh, our benevolence fund is here for people who are the victims of their circumstances, not the primary creators of them. <laughs> oh, man. Wow. Punch to the gut. But then he pulls off a book. It's the Total Money Makeover. And this is going somewhere, by the way. He says, we are going to give you this gift. He said, this is a book about budgeting and managing debt, getting out of debt and giving and, and investing. He's like, I recommend you go read it. If you have questions about managing your finances, I'm happy to help you, but we're not giving you money. But here's this gift. You know, we love you. Let me pray for you. Have a great day. I went and set my little pickup truck and I cried and I was so insulted and embarrassed at first. But then that really turned to a true shame and guilt and repentance of like, what am I doing? Mm. And in that truck, I said, I will never again be in this spot. This spot sucks. 
Like, man, I don't have utilities. I don't have gas money. I don't have food money. And like, what am I doing? And I also realized I never want to take from someone who, you know, they just lost a job. Their spouse just died of cancer. A car wreck just disrupted their life. And I'm taking money from them because I've been immature. Well, my wife knew me before that story. She graduated college and it moved away. And then uh, a few years later, we reconnected after that event happened. And I was a completely different man. So there's no doubt that that was a pivotal point that led my wife to actually find me attractive. Because at the time before, she said, I never would have been attracted to you as foolish as you were em emotionally, financially, all those things. But it created disciplines and a nature about me that actually had some sense, you know, I guess that's, <laughs> that's the way of saying it. So she's been my primary support along the way. And, but I've had definitely friends that have cheered me on, but at the same time, I've had other people who said, dude, what's wrong with you? You're supposed to be a country boy. You know, we used to laugh at people who worked in air conditioned offices. I'll never sit behind a desk and, you know, work in an air conditioned office. I, you know, I get out here and work with my hands. And, you know, I had some of my buddies that like, when I started progressing in life, uh, I no longer fit what they thought was a real man. Mm -hmm. And so that was difficult to have to establish new relationships with people who uh, saw work in a different way. And, and we used to have this phrase around our family and friends growing up. Well, that's just the way he is, or that's just the way she is. And there was this idea that we were fixed in our being and that we couldn't change and we couldn't evolve. And it was okay to excuse our behavior and just justify it and, now I'm around people who are like, no, dude, that's wrong. And you need to change that. Or dude, you keep saying that. And that, that comes across this way. You need to change the way you say it. And like that inner circle has changed the trajectory uh, of my life. So I'm not sure if that really answered your question, but hopefully that story is encouraging and helps people to see, you know, now, you know, I went from the, the trailer house and not be able to have utilities and all that, to, you know, now living in a, you know, $1 million home, you know, and uh, we go on vacations and travel and I've got four kiddos and, you know, debt free in the way that I run my business and my life. And so it's an amazing thing what can happen when you change your inner circle and you change the voices that you're allowing to speak into your life. Yeah, I, I that's beautiful. And I think um, I love that you touched on the inner circle. That's been a conversation. Uh, that our leadership team has, has been adding uh, and, and having and, and wanting to um, to really just spread that to, to the rest. Right. Because it's uh, I mean, you hear it everywhere now. It's, you know, look, look at the five people you text, you know, uh, outside of your family. Who are the five people that you most often text with? And, and you're going to be the average income earner of the, the those five people. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you really quickly start looking at your <laughs> who you're communicating with. And like, oh, I might need to change that up. Um, so speaking of inner circle and maybe even team, so how does this, uh, maybe talk to us a little bit about what I'm always curious is who you end up surrounding yourself when it comes to your team, right? So your, your inner circle might be different from the people that are maybe in your office, right? Or the people that are on your team as far as your production team or your admin team. Um, what do you look for um, in, in those teams and, and, you know, and, and how easy or difficult, challenging is it to find those kind of people nowadays? Yeah, that that is a great question. I'll tell you that for me, of course, because of my background and because of my faith, uh, that strongly directs the type of people I'm willing to allow into my inner circle. Because at the end of the day, you know, I've got strongly held beliefs like there are objective moral values that exist and that uh, there's a creator who created me for a purpose. And uh, I believe in eternity and that one day there's going to be a judgment. And so if I've got those beliefs, it's really hard for me to partner with someone in my inner circle who uh, doesn't, they believe everything's random and that we, there is no purpose behind things. And they don't, they believe that your morals can change based on popularity or what culture de deems, you know, reasonable at the time. So for me, your values have to be shared in your inner circle. And, and, and that's like kind of mentioned the non-starter Patrick Lynch, only with the humble, hungry, smart. If, if our philosophy and values are too separate, then that's a non-starter for me, even if all the professional things we maybe would be a really good match on, because really we're just going down two separate 
separate tracks. Now I learn from all people and I'm willing to go to workshops and hear speakers and have other uh, acquaintances that I do allow, regardless of philosophy or faith beliefs, I'm willing to learn from them, but that doesn't mean they're in my inner circle. Mm -hmm. And so inner circle, we got to be aligned in our values, our principles and our beliefs in general. The second thing I look at is Uh, Do I really enjoy them? Is there uh, not only character that we line up on, but is there uh, a chemistry that connects us Mm -hmm. as well? Where, man, it's just like, it doesn't feel like work being around them. You know, some people are just black holes. And I'm sorry, that's just the way it is. They suck the energy of everything around them and they're just leeches. And you don't want people in your inner circle that when you get around them, they just suck the energy away even if their character is good and even if they have all the other things right, the chemistry has to be there. Mm-hmm. And then uh, the competency. You know, we're going to want to look at the character, the chemistry, and the competency. Like, do they have skills that I desire to have? Right now, I've got some people in my inner circle who they've published books and I've not published a book and I want to. That's on my list to do this year, actually. And so uh, I aspire to that competency on it, uh, public speaking. I've spoken in front of large groups before, but I'm a country boy from Louisiana. Large groups may be in the tens or the hundreds. I've got some people in my inner circle now who are speaking to thousands and tens of thousands. Mm-hmm. And that that's a big deal. Um, most recently, uh, I say recently, over the past two years, uh, I have really become a huge fan of the six types of working geniuses. And the premise of that is, is there's six geniuses and everyone has two, which means you don't have the other four. And if you don't have the other four, then you're going to be lopsided in the way that you work and you're going to be missing steps in the creative and productive process. So now in my inner circle, I make sure, and on my teams as well, my inner circle and on my teams, I want to make sure that my geniuses are all represented because I've only got two of the six and I want to make sure I've got other people who have the four. So that's kind of the way I approach Mm -hmm. uh, teams and the inner circle. Uh, And you really want to, I use those things separate because let me tell you, you you can have an inner circle at your work, but you also need to have a broader inner circle that's not deep in the weeds with you. You need to have somebody that's on the outside looking in that has a different perspective, that doesn't have skin in the game per se, but they care about you as a a player, so to speak. That's what a good coach does, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, but a good inner circle, they're saying, hey, um, I can see this objectively and uh, a good inner circle can help you evaluate that. That's right. I love that. Uh, And again, I think those different perspectives uh, and and again, where they're, you know, they they don't have um, an interest in, in the outcome of what you're doing, but they have an interest in you. So, yeah. you know, even yes. for me, like, you know, I, I have, I have father figures, right. As a father, I want to have other father figures that are in my inner circle where, where, you know, they're further down the line, right. John Maxwell yes. always said, you know, look at someone who is 10 years ahead, ahead of you. Right. Uh, because they, they're the ones that have the wisdom. So you have those, you have other business owners, right. Uh, you have uh, people in your, in your spiritual, in your faith walk, right, that, that are ahead of you. And so I'm just curious, because I, I don't know the six. Uh, I'm not familiar with the six types of working geniuses. Can, mm-hmm. can you name those real quick? Yeah. And, uh, and then tell me which two you have? Yeah, no, that's a good one. So uh, this is really easy to remember, because uh, the abbreviation for it is widget. So those are the six geniuses. So we start with W. W is the wonder genius. And by the way, as I give you all of these, these are not just six random ones. These are in a chronological order. So as I'm explaining these, you'll see how this is kind of the way things come to be. So wonder is the beginning one. The wonder geniuses, these individuals are really great about identifying possibilities, seeing risk, you know, and where potential problems or uh, opportunities may be in it. They tend to be very, very big picture And they have gut feels for where things uh, need to go broadly, but not necessarily specifically, but they just kind of know, man, we really should be shifting this direction, but maybe not the exact route. And so wonder geniuses many times will go stare out the window and they're imagining, you know, great things. Mm -hmm. Now, the second one is closely tied to it, but it's a little bit different. It's called the genius of invention. So the genius of invention responds to the wonder genius by saying, oh, you know, the other day you mentioned that you wondered if there was a market opportunity here. I've actually got an idea or solution for that. 
So the wonder genius kind of identifies the broad possibility and the invention genius gives an idea, plan, product around it. And I want to make a little comment here. You've heard this statement before, and I use, I've used this statement before, and I feel bad because I think it's horrible now. Because you, have you ever heard this where you hear a leader say, you only come into my office with a problem if you've got a solution, right? Right, yep. And we've heard that. So we used to say, come in with two solutions. <laughs> yeah, two solutions. Yeah, if you, you got a complaint or a problem, you come in with one or two solutions or ideas <laughs> on how to fix it. I have the a feeling you're about to debunk that now. <laughs> yeah, that's right. The challenge with that is, is some people have the wonder genius so they can identify a potential risk or problem or opportunity. They are not invention geniuses, though. They don't know what the idea is. They don't know how to fix it or where to go, but they're just going, hey, I'm seeing something over here. I'm sensing something over here. You may want to take a look at it, leader. Do not shut those people down. Those are like radars for you that they the radar doesn't know how to dissect the thing, but it knows how to detect the thing. And so uh, don't shut those people down. And if you have a wonder genius on your team, they can be a great ally for you as a leader. The invention geniuses create the solution or plan around it. The D is a discernment genius. So once the idea or the plan is out there, the discernment genius is really good at weighing the pros, the cons, the uh, is this scalable? Is it going to be profitable? Is it really practical? Is it legal? <laughs> you know, they just have all these filters and they are so wise in the way that they approach the situation. So they aren't necessarily the creative type that comes up with the stuff. Mm -hmm. But when the stuff that has been come up with, they can really know if it's good stuff or bad stuff. All right. That's so good. that's the discernment genius. Once the idea has kind of made it through the discernment genius, then the galvanizing genius, that's the G, they step into play. And the galvanizing genius are the ones who are so great at building enthusiasm and excitement and buy-in around an idea. And so, man, galvanizers are great people to have uh, on your team. If you're a creative type and you come up with stuff, but then it just seems to fizzle out or things like that, it may be because you don't have a galvanizing genius. And I'll pause right here for a moment, give an insurance application. Uh, I had a team, uh, a small team, and we were producing and we did the working geniuses on this team and we did not have a galvanizing genius on our team. And what it revealed to me that was already there, but I just hadn't noticed it, was that my team did things because they were paid to do them. It was their job. They were supposed to. It was the morally right thing to do, and they were good people. They were just being mature about it. They weren't necessarily doing things because they were excited mm -hmm. or motivated passionate, yeah. and passionate. And I was going, oh, my gosh, man. And so I really worked hard to get us a galvanizing genius to give us a little jolt on there and create a – it made it more fun when you have a galvanizing genius mm. uh, on the team. So once the galvanizing genius has everybody rah rod ready to go, excited, bought in, and, and do it, that's when the enablement geniuses step up. And enablement geniuses, they're usually the frontline people who really love to carry out the task. You know, they're the lieutenants and they uh, are great at assisting uh, the visionary with their vision. They don't necessarily have to have their vision or their opinion or their way. Just tell them what to do and man, they'll do it. They're usually the first to jump on. And like, if you're super clear with what you expect and you give it to them, they execute it. Very task oriented. Uh, yeah. Very task oriented and super supportive. Uh, almost every assistant I've ever had, as we've done these now, they're enablement geniuses. All of my support people yeah. end up being enablement geniuses. Makes sense. Then the last one would be the genius of tenacity. And the tenacity geniuses, man, these people get stuff done. They push it across the finish line, they make sure it's brought to completion. They shine the brightest at the end of a project or the event or a deadline. Uh, man, they just really have the grit and the determination to accomplish what everybody else, everybody else is already bored and on to the next thing. And they're going, no, we're going to see this thing through. Mm -hmm. Anybody who's successful and productive likes to check things off of their list and feel like they accomplished something, but nobody loves it more than a tenacity genius. They love to check things off the list because they just love finishing things and pushing it across the goal line. So those yeah. are the six geniuses. 
And if you're missing any one of those, you can see how it would create an issue on your team. Mm -hmm. If you've got wonder and invent, but no discernment, you're rolling out ideas that everybody gets excited about and does, but they, they were illegal or they weren't profitable or they weren't really thought well thought out. Or if you've got wonder, but no invention, people are identifying problems, but there's never any solutions around them because nobody's really the problem solver. Or if you've got all these things, but you don't have enablement tenacity, the ball gets rolling and then never actually gets there. And so you need to have this balance on your team. So for me, my two geniuses are wonder and discernment, wonder and discernment. Mm. And based on what your two geniuses are, we call it a pairing. And my pairing, your pairing gives you a unique title or a descriptor on it. So my pairing uh, for a WD or a DW is going to be contemplative counselor. And so what I'm really good at is is thinking through things deeply and abstractly and identifying uh, these concepts and principles and counseling people through them. That's what I really bring uh, to the table. I'm not the galvanizer that goes, like when I do team events and workshops, I'm not the cheerleader to come in and rah-rah everybody and get them all excited. I'm the one that's coming in and dissecting team dynamics and figuring out why sales are down. You know? Yeah, So I see that. I see that. Yeah. And, and that totally makes sense. And as I'm going through, I'm like, hmm. And I'm sure you, everyone's got maybe a little bit of each one. Uh, but there's probably yeah. two primary, like you said, pairings. Um, sure. So part of the premise of the working geniuses are is, is that, uh, yeah, you do have a little bit of all the geniuses, but you're, you have two primary geniuses, then two of them are competencies. And then two of them are frustrations. Hmm. Now, what's the difference between a competency and a genius? Well, a genius is something that you're really good at doing and you're productive at it. And it also brings you energy and joy. Whereas a competency is something that you're able to do really well, but it drains your energy and joy. Mm -hmm. And there are some people who are really great at some aspect of their insurance or real estate or mortgage world or whatever it is they're doing. They're really great at it, but it is draining their energy and joy and they don't know why. And it's because they're not in their genius area because uh, you can be good. And that's what the one problem I have with some of these other assessments. Well, here's your strengths or here's your talents. Well, some people are good at stuff that they hate doing. Right. And so anyway, that's the difference in a genius and a competency. And then a frustration is obvious. You aren't good at it and it takes your energy and joy away. So the key is, is to eliminate work in your frustration areas, limit the work in your competency areas and do as much as possible in your genius areas. Yeah. And so Justin, it sounds like you, you work with, uh, obviously with your team and your folks, um, and and do you work with other teams? Is this like part of the oh, some yeah. of the workshops and stuff that you that you put on? And then maybe people have you come in and and do a private yeah. session and things like that. That's that's one absolutely. Yeah, I, one of my favorite things to do, especially right now in this season of life, is uh, these assessments only take you know ten minutes or less for an individual to do. And so we get teams where they do these assessments, they get their report, and then we create a team map for them. Mm -hmm. And we go in and do a workshop with their team and show them their team map, show them their individual results, and we help them understand themselves and their team better. And we create different SOPs for a team. We sometimes, they change roles or tasks based on their geniuses. It's amazing seeing, and there's two big things it does for a team. It eliminates shame for an individual that they feel themselves this like, oh, I'm not pulling my weight or I stink at this thing or I, why am I not excited about this? It eliminates that that shame, but it also eliminates judgment mm -hmm. towards other people on a team. Like, man, how come he never does this thing right here? Well, it's because that's his in frustration area. He's not good at it and it takes his joy, but you also don't do this thing because you're not good at it and it takes your joy. So it really creates a, a, an awesome dynamic where you can really have joy and productivity at a whole new level in your work. Yeah. And I love the context of, uh, of it being framed around a, a genius, right? These six different yes. geniuses. I, I'd never heard that. And, you know, I'm familiar with obviously other personality trait uh, programs and things like that. But that's interesting. I'd love to, you know, maybe learn more with you at some point. 
But um, so let's do this. We're, you know, we're coming to, to the end of um, end of our time here. And, you know, and I know you, you've sprinkled some throughout, but please let let people know someone's listening in and, and, and they're maybe in the Dallas area or, or they want to learn more about any of these um, these workshops that you have. How can people how can people find you, Justin? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, yeah, the website for me is improver.coach, improver.coach. And then for our network is improver.network. And so you can find out about membership on the network page, or you can find out about working genius, Ziggler, full focus planner, all that stuff is on my dot coach uh, page on there. So that's uh, the easiest way to just research information. If you want to reach out to me directly, it's justin at improver.coach. Justin at improver.coach. And I'm also on uh, Facebook. I've got a YouTube channel. This is a, this is a new thing for me is getting on the YouTube uh, as doing video uh, coaching and things like that. But um, so I've got, I don't know, maybe 15 or 20 videos and we're rolling one out every week. So I'm looking for subscribers. Uh, we've got the improver network podcast. So if you're into that, uh, yeah, all over the place. So wonderful. <laughs> Justin, it's funny. Yeah. Uh, you're in the networking space, obviously, because and, and we've all heard the saying, right? And you can probably finish it. The, your your network is your <laughs> yeah, your net worth is your net or your network is your net worth. Is that what right. you're talking about? Yeah. Either one, right? right. Your it network is your ways. net worth yeah. or your net worth is your network. And I, I used to I used to subscribe to that and then I realized it is an incomplete statement. It is an incomplete statement. It is that your your legwork into your <laughs> network is your sure. net worth. That's right. right. Yeah. And it sounds like you're really building that legwork. And so I, I appreciate you sharing all of that. Uh, Justin loved having you on the show, yeah. my friend. I appreciate you, man. Uh, looking, looking forward to, to getting to know you, uh, know you more and, and anyone like you, Justin, that you want to, you know, send our way um, that, yeah. that, that has got great stories that has got, uh, you know, uh, any one of the, or two, I guess of the geniuses, because <laughs> we'll have to round out the show. We'd love to hear from you. But Justin, yeah. stick around after we're done here. I'm going to yeah. stop the recording. I appreciate your time. Any parting words? Oh, man. Uh, I, I will share one little thing. And this is our tagline at the Improver Group. We say good and getting better. And the reason mm -hmm. we use that, because we think improvement, you have to learn to be content, but not be complacent. And you have to recognize the good around you before you can really get better. And if you've listened to this podcast this far, you're somebody who's trying to get better. You're trying to learn. You're trying to grow. Before you can really grow and improve, you've got to have an attitude of gratitude. You got to start with Thanksgiving. Celebrate your wins. Mm -hmm. Don't always be driving to the next level without starting with the good. So uh, I always part out with our audience and say, "Hey, stay good and keep getting better." I love it. There's that humility. I appreciate yeah. <laughs> you, Justin. God bless. Take care now. Thank you.